Hey there, FakeFox here. Welcome to my complete class guide for the Arcanist as a PvE healer. In this video I will explain Arcanist's entire toolkit and how to effectively build and play the class as a PvE healer. So Arcanist is the newest class added to ESO and similar to the previous two DLC classes, Warden and Necromancer, it has a dedicated skill line for each role and with that a relatively large amount of healing and support abilities. As Arcanist is a brand new class, I can obviously not give you an overview of its history and so it's difficult to judge at this point how popular the class will become. Some of what I will say throughout this video will therefore be more of an educated guess. But let's continue with some hard facts. Arcanist is themed around shields and channel abilities and has a unique resource called Crux, which I will explain in detail later. Its healing power is certainly impressive, but hidden behind somewhat clunky mechanics, Arcanist has a wide range of support effects, with the more important ones being Minor Evasion, Minor Courage, Minor Endurance, Minor Intellect, Minor Vulnerability, Minor Brittle, and an ultimate with a unique 200 weapon and spell damage buff. In the next section we will go over the three skill lines in detail. Arcanist's healing line is Creative Rune Forms. The passives increase healing done for each crux by 3%, so up to 9% in total. Generating crux also restores a tiny amount of resources. Recoveries are permanently increased by 18% and shields are 10% cheaper and also stronger. The first active ability is Runemend. It's essentially a single target burst heal as the three projectiles always hit the same target. It's quite decent if you need a long range burst heal in situations where you just cannot use combat prayer. Both morph effects are not particularly impactful and more or less situational. An interesting fact about the skill is that it costs either stamina or magicka depending on what is the higher maximum. This is also the case for a few other skills, but in general as a healer they will cost you magicka since going for stamina just doesn't make any sense. This is also the case for the next ability. Remedy Cascade is an AoE burst heal with a 4.5 second channel time. It's extremely strong and also kind of cost efficient, however it can't really do anything that Combat Prayer can't do and with its very very long channel time it negatively affects CPM and thereby potentially support and is just extremely inconvenient in general. The cone is also very narrow. It consumes Crux to restore resources but that's also not overly amazing I think. All in all I would not use this ability apart from maybe healing checks like the Ice Tomes in VSS. In terms of Morphs I think Cascading Fortune is generally better as it generates better effective healing while Creative Surge often just inflates the overhealing. Chakram Shields applies a shield to 4 players. The shield is quite strong for a spammable ability. Particularly in 4 player content I consider this ability really good especially for content where the additional safety a shield provides over normal healing is really needed, so for example trifecta runs. The Chakram of Destiny morph can be used to generate Crux and I also generally consider it the better morph. It also increases the shield's strength when overcasting it, which certainly can be good. The other morph is rather pointless in my opinion, as the healing only works when you don't take damage, which just doesn't make any sense. You don't need healing when you don't take damage. It's also an ability with hybrid cost by the way. Arcanist's Domain is a large AoE that buffs Mind Endurance Intellect and most noticeably Courage. This is a really big deal as it makes minor Courage sets obsolete. It's also one of the better ways of applying those recovery buffs. For entirely static encounters, Reconstructive Domain is probably the better morph, but the healing is relatively weak so we can absolutely take Senna's Empowering Disc as well for more consistency. Apocryphal Gate summons two portals we can teleport between. Nothing particularly relevant for PvE, but you can certainly use it for kite rolls and it's also just a fun ability to play around with. However, I find the range and duration to be really lackluster. As far as morphs go, Fleet Footed Gate grants Major Expedition, which could be nice for Cloud Rest or Asylumic Sanctorum for example. Passage Between Worlds allows other players to use the portal, which might also be nice for getting around faster in between fights. The ultimate Vitalizing Glyphic gives a unique up to 200 weapon and spell damage buff for 15 seconds. I think it's a really cool ability. It spawns kind of a floating rock that can be healed up and the buff becomes stronger the more health it has, 
It's not actually all that strong though, compared to Warren. 10% more resources should generally already be a bit more than 200 weapon and spell damage, and Warhorn also lasts twice as long, and also has the additional effects. The main selling point for White Abilizing Glyphic really is that it is a unique effect, so it can be stacked with a Warhorn. This is obviously really amazing for short fights, where you can just throw out all your ultimates at once, but also in certain trial setups where groups get enough Warhorn uptime with only two players running it, so one of the healers can run a different ultimate. When it comes to the morph choice, the important factor is how fast you can get it to full power, which is somewhat situational. However, given that you have enough healing in a given situation, Glyphic of the Tides is better, I think, for the major protection, and it's also less irritating for the damage dealers. Herald of the Tome is our damage line. The passives increase status effect chance by 75% and damage by 15%. Every slotted skill of the line also increases penetration. Consuming Crux increases critical healing and damage by 12% for 7 seconds. And Restoring Resources increases weapon and spell damage by 5% for 10 seconds. Recovery does not count for that, so we actually need something that directly restores resources. We can keep it up by constantly generating Crux or with Arcanist sustainability, for example. It of course also gets activated by resource support from other players, various CP, weapon passives and so on, but those will usually not keep it up permanently. Runeplate is a damage spammable, it's not particularly good and has no secondary effects apart from generating Crux. It's currently not used at all by damage dealers, and for us it's also just not really interesting, even if we want to deal some damage. Fate Carver is a channeled conal damage ability, essentially the DPS version of Remedy Cascade. It's very, very powerful, but I think the required crux management and long channel time make it generally unattractive for healers, unless we go for a complete hybrid build. Pragmatic Fate Cover is the weaker morph in terms of damage potential, but in my opinion still generally more suitable for healers, as the longer duration of the other one leads to just more problems. Abyssal Impact can be a really strong damage ability, it works by empowering other damage sources, so it's not really something we want to be using in normal healer builds, but it can be really good for off healing builds to deal pretty high DPS with relatively few damage skills. Cephaliarch's Flail seems to generally work better for that, to generate Crux which is then used to empower Fate Cover. Tomebearer's Inspiration is a decent ability to gain major sorcery and brutality and to also generate Crux. Recuperative Treaties is generally the more interesting more for a healer, for the additional sustain I think. The Imperfect Ring is an AoE dot. Fulminating Rune is quite interesting, particularly in trash and multi-target boss encounters the synergy deals a ton of damage and it can be used by 3 players. The Unblinking Eye is simply a really strong damage ultimate. It's not overly important for us as support ultimates usually have a higher impact on group damage. But if you need a damage ultimate, this is probably what you should go for. The final skill line is Soldier of Apocrypha, Arcanist's tanking line. It passively increases our armor when a skill of the line is active on us. Each slotted Soldier of Apocrypha skill also increases recoveries. Consuming Crux generates 4 ultimate every 8 seconds. And finally, Arcanist's class buff. Casting a class ability gives the group 20 seconds of minor evasion. The first active ability is a taunt. When we need to taunt, this is probably better than in a fire, but that's it. Runic Sunder decreases resistances by 2200, which is nice, but of course not something we can just apply as it's tied to a taunt. Runespite Ward is a shield with health scaling, not relevant for healing, I think. Fate Woven Armor is basically your box standard major resolve ability. It debuffs minor breach to enemies hitting us. Even as a healer this can work in some situations, but it's generally not relevant as tanks should apply minor breach anyways. Runic defense applies minor resolve to the group. This isn't really worthwhile in my opinion. There are very very few fights where we don't use combat prayer to begin with, and in those very few fights it's usually not possible to apply an ability with only 10 meters range. Rune of Eldritch Horror, specifically Rune of the Colorless Pool, is an amazing support ability. It's Fetra Infection on steroids basically, debuffing 20 seconds of minor vulnerability and brittle. 
And lastly, the ultimate Gibbering Shield morphed into Gibbering Shelter. It's a pretty decent defensive ultimate. In four player groups and against consistent damage, it beats barrier. So for example, the healing checks in Balsunar, this is really strong. So let's quickly talk about the Crux mechanic in more detail. As you've already seen, there are quite a few abilities that generate or consume Crux. You can also see if a skill generates or consumes Crux in the upper left corner of the icon, by the way. Crux is a buff that can stack up to three times. It's displayed by these triangular runes spinning around the character. It has no duration and stays active out of combat. Abilities that are empowered by Crux consume all charges at once. Generating Crux, consuming Crux and just having Crux active in general all have their benefits tied to different passives. For dealing damage it's really quite straightforward. Generate as much Crux as possible to then empower damage abilities. For healing it's questionable whether always having 3 Crux for 9% increased healing or actively using it is more beneficial. Actively engaging with the system is technically stronger for sure in terms of sustain and also healing power. But the issue is that the crux generating as well as consuming skills for healers all just kind of suck. In my opinion, it is therefore better for a healer to just ignore the crux mechanic, unless you have so much bar space, time and also micromanagement capacity available that you can engage with this minigame without it affecting your performance in other aspects. Okay, now we go into the build section of this video and we start with the bar layouts. When setting up my bars for really anything, I think about what my build has to be able to do, what sets I'm wearing, what position I have to play in the group and so on. I then work through this checklist, assigning fitting abilities for each requirement. I think burst healing is always a good starting point. Combat prayer is essential for its buffs, but also as a really good burst heal almost anywhere. This means that additional burst healing is only really relevant when we need to do something that Combat Prayer cannot do. For Arcanist, this makes Runement potentially useful for its high range. Healing Ward is another good option when we need to counter single target healing debuffs. And since we're already talking about shields, Bone Surge is our counter to AoE healing debuffs. And Check Room of Destiny is also a really nice shield ability, specifically for 4 player content. But if you have the time to spam it, it's also actually really good for trials. The main source of our healing should be our healing over time though. How many hots we use depends on how much bar space we have and how difficult the content is. I recommend anywhere between 2 to 5. Energy Orb is one we often need for the combustion synergy. Then for pure healing, my default is Healing Springs and Echoing Vigor. If we need even more hots in a static fight, we can also use Ring of Preservation. Or if we need to be mobile, Radiating Regeneration. We might also have Reconstructive Domain, that's an ability we should be using for its buff. The healing is more of a nice side effect. Speaking about support, we need a weapon ability to proc our backbar enchantment. This is usually Elemental Blockade. Other general support might include any source of minor life or magical steel like Blood Altar or Elemental Drain. Specifically for the Arcanist, the Rune of the Colorless Pool and Arcanist's Domain are the two most common ones and in some situations maybe also Crux Weave Armor or Runic Defense. I think Fulminating Rune is also a really interesting ability for the synergy that we can take as a filler, especially in Trash I would absolutely recommend it. For specific sets we might also need special abilities. Those should be fairly self-explanatory and also rarely needed anyways. If we are done with our checklist and still have open slots, we can always take more hots or just damage abilities or also quality of life skills like recuperative treaties for a sustain. And since I've often been asked about trash setups, when you also play as a normal healer in trash, Bar layouts don't really need to change a lot. The most important thing is that you don't really need any of your single target debuffs like Rune of the Colorless Pool. Instead use AoE debuffs if you have them. For healing and buffs, abilities that can be pre-buffed have a higher priority as the encounters are usually very short, but that's about it. Another more specialized topic I quickly want to touch on is off healing, as it's potentially really strong but not particularly easy to understand with Arcanist. 
So for most classes, when transitioning from full healer to damage dealer, you generally want to introduce more and more dots and offensive stats into your build, and eventually maybe also spammable. Arcanist doesn't have this smooth transition. You can of course focus on optimizing your offensive stats and use a few dots as a healer with at least decent results, but I think if you want to get really good damage numbers, you absolutely have to commit to it, as Arcanist's damage potential comes from crux management and ability interaction. Essentially, you have to play Fate Cover and empower it with Cephaliarch's Flail. This has amazing damage potential, but is relatively difficult to do as a healer, as it just takes up so much time. To finish this section of the video, we need to arrange our bars in a sensible way. That means having important passives and short abilities concentrated on our front bar. Arcanist has very few passives tied to abilities. Having a Soldier of Apocrypha skill on our front bar increases sustain, but that's about it. So in terms of passives, we obviously need our three class lines and whatever weapons and armor we are using. So normally light and medium armor, healing and destruction stuff. Further undaunted and maybe mages or fighters skilled if we use active abilities from these lines. Then magic aid from alliance war, racial passives and lastly medicinal use from alchemy. For the race, my recommendations depend on what you exactly want to be doing. If you are almost exclusively playing as a full healer, I recommend Breton more than anything. It has the best magic is sustained by a mile and really nice survivability. If you also want to occasionally play as a damage dealer or dabble with hybrid roles, I recommend Altmer or Dunmer instead, and Gajit is also a really solid choice. In the next part, we will talk about gear. I split the sets up into dungeons and trials, as the requirements are drastically different. In dungeons we want to be providing as much, usually offensive support, for our group as possible. This leads to Spell Procure and Master Architect as the perfect combination. Other similar sets like Sex Little Champion, Olorim, Powerful Assault or Roaring Opportunist are also fine but not as strong. Another interesting option can be including Ultigen into our support with for example Drake's Rush or Cautious Genius. We are giving up sustained DPS, but we gain more frequent ultimate drops, which can be very potent and for player content, and we can also use barrier more often, and barrier spam is pretty much the best defensive strategy. For the secondary sets, in my opinion, Pearls of Elnafe with Symphony of Blades or A Season the Inferno is the strongest. Spalda of Ruin is certainly another really powerful mythic, but it can't be combined with a monster set and the ability altering support weapons are all not really that great at the moment. If you want to go for an off healer build, both Pearls and Spalda don't really work. I would instead recommend a DPS mythic with a monster set or ability altering weapon. Especially for the Arcanist, the Velothi Ur Mage's amulet is absolutely amazing. The stats it gives are perfect for 4 player content with penetration and critical damage. Arcanist has relatively low light attack damage because of the long channels and well let's be real here, weaving isn't necessarily a strength of support players anyways. So let's now talk about the trial setups. Currently a combination of two specific builds is used almost everywhere. This is one healer with Warring Opportunist and Jovel's Guidance, mostly combined with Spold of Ruin and a Mass Restoration staff and the other with Spell Power Cure and Pillager's Prophet, Pearls of Elnafe and usually Nazare or any other monster set. The most common deviation from this is groups using Master Architect in very short fights or encounters with particularly pronounced damage phases. Another exception is a Sound Sanctorum where we just see completely different builds and also group compositions. But coming back to that Rojo and Ultigen combination, it doesn't really matter which one Arcanist uses, so I think it's mostly dependent on what class we are healing with, especially with Nightblade, which synergizes exceptionally well with an Ultigen build. But the most common healing partner will probably be Warden, and here it's mostly personal preference in my opinion. As I already mentioned, in some situations we might need to wear different sets, so let's quickly go over those as well and look at how those work for Arcanist. Must Architect, Sexual Champion and Powerful Assault are probably the most common replacement sets and class really doesn't matter for any of them. When we get into the more special ones, the only set that Arcanist really should not be using is Elemental Catalyst, as the class has nothing to keep up any of the three elements and so 
you only ever have two active unless you are using crushing shock which is rather impractical for a healer sensor dress is not necessarily optimal but it shouldn't be an issue arcanist has increased status effect chance after all martial knowledge also isn't really an issue for arcanist but i don't find it particularly pleasant to play as the class relies a lot on stamina recovery for survival is defensively rather weak and has no relevant stamina abilities leading to a lot of vigor spamming when combining sets, we want to avoid heavy armor. Light and medium can both be beneficial. Light gives us better magical sustain and medium stronger healing when sustain is not an issue. For DPS, it's a similar thing. Light armor increases penetration, but if that is not needed, medium increases the damage more. The next topic are traits and enchantments. Our armor should normally be all divine with magicka. Infused prismatic, particularly on the big pieces, is also an option. I personally think the difference is negligible though and Divines with Magicka is just way more flexible. For the Jewelry, Infused is generally slightly stronger than a cane. As enchantments we can use Magicka regeneration if we need sustain or otherwise spell and weapon damage. In terms of sustain I find Arcanist to be quite strong but you really need to do your own testing here. I see a lot of players over sustaining and it's a huge waste of healing and damage. The same goes for running dry of course. Usually you will probably end up anywhere between 1500 to 2000 magic of recovery. Also keep in mind that Darkness' sustain comes mostly from strong recovery modifiers, so it will have and also need higher recoveries than other classes. For the front bar weapon I recommend Decisive as a default, Precise if you deal damage and Powered if you need maximum healing power. Charge can sometimes be good as well in niche situations when working with status effects. The back bar is more straightforward. Infused is usually the only real option. By the way, the weapon element doesn't really matter unless we need a specific element for support, since that's something I'm being asked a lot. Anyways, as enchantments, we can use Crusher or Weakening for support or any element we need for a status effect. If we need nothing specific, we can always just use Berserker or even Absorb Magicka. The more important enchantment has to be on the back bar to get empowered by infused and we also never want to use the same enchantment twice. Moving on to buff food and attribute points, magicka and health or magicka and magicka recovery are ever so slightly more stat efficient than other buff food options. Magicka, magicka regeneration and health food is nevertheless a good option to me as having different buff food options available gives us a lot of flexibility that can easily outperform the minimally higher total stat. We can then put attribute points into health to fine tune it. Generally I recommend somewhere between 22 to 25,000 health. The rest then just goes into magicka. For the Manda Stone ritual is the best for pure healing and the for pure damage as well as hybrid rolls. If you go a bit into damage, Thief becomes worthwhile essentially immediately, in my opinion, as the healing loss is really negligible. As potions, for difficult content we can use either Essence of Spell Power, Weapon Power or Tribe Restoration potions, depending on what buffs we get from our group and how much sustain we need. Heroism potions can potentially be even better, but it's just too expensive in most scenarios. The Looted Essence of Magicka or Essence of Stamina potions are also totally usable in easier content. Don't waste your gold on good potions when just farming sets or whatever. Moving on to the champion points, the green CP mostly doesn't matter, but what I do recommend is Steed's Blessing to better keep up with the group in between fights. For the blue CP on a full healing build I generally recommend a split of two healing and two support or survivability nodes. For healing, Soothing Tide and Swift Renewal are usually most impactful. For the other two nodes, I normally play in Livening Overflow and From the Brink. In a trial group, only one healer needs them, so you can additionally fit in Hope Infusion. Other open slots can be filled with more healing. When a build has a relevant damage component, I often go just straight for damage nodes, for example with off healing builds. As a baseline, I use Backstabber and Wrathful Strikes. Fighting Finesse if I need more critical damage, Force of Nature if I need more penetration, or otherwise some combination of Deadly Aim, Thaumaturge, Master at Arms and Biting Aura, depending on what damage types I have. In the recipe I almost always use Celerity. In my opinion, Movement Speed is an amazing defensive tool, especially for healers. I mean, we usually have to move around a lot, 
Apart from that, siphoning spells can be a great sustain tool I like to use in off healing builds. Expert evasion and slippery can help with stamina sustain. Spirit mastery can be useful as well. And shield master and bastion can be nice when actively playing barrier or similar shield abilities, which is especially relevant for arcanist. If nothing specific is needed, boundless vitality, fortified, and rejuvenation are always good. So for the last part of this video, we will take a look at how Arcanist can be integrated into groups. As I already said in the intro, this is a lot of speculation. Arcanist certainly has the potential for a meta class, but we just can't tell yet what groups will determine to be the most optimal way of using it. New classes are also usually not particularly well balanced and tend to go through significant changes after their release, so keep that in mind when watching this video, let's say half a year after Necrom. But anyways, let's start with dungeons and arenas. In my opinion, Arcanist is one of the two strongest support classes for this content, tied with Warden and with Nightblade as a close third. Because of the low number of players, the support in 4 player groups is always limited, you just can't have everything. This means that redundancy usually is less of an issue and the total amount of support a class provides is really important. And Arcanist really does have quite a lot. However, I think that Arcanist might actually end up being more popular as a tank, as it seems to be a really strong tank in general, and then it can provide the additional penetration, which it cannot do as a healer. Also, I find Warden to be stronger in terms of healing power and mechanics. Another option could be having an Arcanist DD, as all it takes is a single support ability, namely Arcanist's domain, to get the majority of the class's support out of a damage dealer. For Trials, we have to look at what Arcanist effectively provides if we take redundant support out of the equation, and that is mostly Minor Courage and Minor Evasion. Minor Courage is really interesting because it frees up a support set. Minor Evasion can be quite good in certain encounters, most noticeably Tightborn Teleria and Lord Falgraven, but it is situational, and there are also fights where it does absolutely nothing. Also worth mentioning is the Rune of the Colorless Pool, it provides nothing exclusive with minor vulnerability and brittle, but it's nevertheless tremendously convenient. And lastly, Vitalizing Glyphic can be strong in either very short fights or when a group needs only two Warhorns because it is running Saxley Champion and Pillager's Prophet. In my opinion, Warden and Nightblade is still the most optimal healer combination for most trials, and it's generally better to have an Arcanist tank where possible or otherwise an Arcanist DD. There are also fights where both aren't really viable and healer becomes kind of the only solution, for example the second and third boss of Dreadsail Reef. But there are also different opinions on the entire topic. For example, I've seen that Nefas says Arcanist healer is more optimal in general than Nightblade. But anyway, going away from the most optimal, I think in more casual trial content, without the same exact group composition week after week, Arcanist has a lot better chances. It's really flexible, has no obvious weaknesses and provides good support from the basic things like minor recovery buffs to its more exclusive stuff. So in conclusion, I think if Arcanist Healer looks fun to you, absolutely go for it. And you should not run into any issues finding groups or content the class can't do. Getting into more recent refactors or even score pushing, groups might not want an Arcanist Healer, but let's be real here, that can happen with any class. But with that, I don't have anything else to say. I think we covered everything to give you a good starting point with the Arcanist. As always, you can find links with additional information in the video description. If you have any unanswered questions, feel free to ask me in the comments. I highly appreciate any interactions. That's what makes video creation fun and it also helps the channel grow. Thanks for watching and bye.